Well, Nick, thanks very much for joining me. Really interested in your sort of end of year recap about the world of podcasting. And I suppose a starter for 10 and going into that essay, which is on Future Proof on, on your newsletter, it's what is the current state of podcasting and it does does it need to be saved? Uh, well, the current state of podcasting is such a kind of broad question. And, and I, I guess part of the answer to that question also complicates the first part of the question, which is that podcasting is now such a diverse and um varied thing and it means so many different things to different people there's so many different types of podcasts and there's so many different directions that it's going that to to, to take a kind of holistic panoptic view is sort of probably you're going to end up reducing yourself and kind of kind of making over commitments and over judgments of the whole whole industry so um podcasting is the state of podcasting now is complicated the traditional podcast format I think has all sorts of problems I think there's all sorts of financial pressures on it I think it's probably had its um, period of hyper investment hyper big paydays for people lots of um, you know lots of people thinking that it's the next big thing I think that probably has now been done but it doesn't mean that the podcast is even though I mean I, I my essay is titled the podcasting is dead it doesn't mean that podcasting is dead it's just iterating away from something that looks like the podcasting of the last 15, 20 years. Um, and and in that sense, podcasting, I think, could legitimately seem, be seen to be in quite rude health. I mean, it, it just really depends on your perspective um, and, and what you're willing to accept as a pod, as, as a podcast. What is what is a podcast? And that's kind of my kind of crucial point that I was making in this piece was um, the, the, you know, the word podcast just goes, it harks back to this time when it was the pod from the iPod and the cast from this idea of RSS feeds. It was a very sort of open access world of kind of world of like um, self-broadcasting, self-publishing through predominantly through this Apple index. But, you know, other people kind of joined it, but they use the same technology. And and that was what a podcast was and has been. And, and, and it's kind of gradually come to mean sort of more plural things. But now I think we're moving into a phase where the product is basically um, unrecognizable from those early days. And therefore, the use of the term podcasting is, is, is probably, you know, fairly redundant. I mean, I, you know, I increasingly refer to audio on demand products, uh, but I also think that, um, you know, as video becomes better integrated as the video pod, I mean, video podcast is such a nonsense term that there's got to be a better word for for describing that thing and so i'm just i'm kind of curious in my own way to see the where the industry kind of brands itself in the in the coming year or so i mean that's that's help out on the focus there and i think one of the main questions that i had also as a consumer of a lot of this i'm a really big fan of youtube and i think a lot of people use those so-called video podcasts for want of a better term for sort of quite relaxing um sort of non sort of um involved listening and watching in the background for example and we've seen other things that have really taken off on youtube for instance like lo-fi girl for studying something that you can put on the on, on the background but i i suppose that is going back to your sort of it's moved from a sort of quite lo-fi quite indie space to um these videos and i know we've spoken in the past about the sort of production side of things and the lack of editing and frankly, rambling. Um, how much do you think this is an issue? And how much do you think it's just people putting streams of content out there, hours upon hours, um, just for the sake of hitting the uh, YouTube algorithm and just trying to get more ad revenue, really? Well, there's a sweet spot with all of these things. I mean, in podcasting, you can make a really polished product. You can edit it and work, have a whole production team working on it and spend months, if not years, on it. But the only people who can make those products are people who are either public broadcasters like the BBC or NPR or, you know, big tech companies like Amazon, which now owns places like Wondery or Spotify, which has its own original studios and spaces like Gimlet, um, who can basically do it as a loss leader and basically say, look, we are at the foreground of podcasting. But, you know, they don't have the financial imperatives there. So it's basically in order to make something that is really concise and edited and good you know, for want of a more sophisticated word, you have to be willing to lose money on it, essentially, just spend money and not get gain it back. Um, 
And so, you know, that's at one end of the spectrum. And then at the other end of the spectrum, yeah, sure, people are um, just putting out, spapping out content, uh, you know, hours and hours of it in order to sort of try and, you know, get the algorithm to work for them or to try and, you know, create these sort of very passive consumption experiences like you refer to with like lo-fi stuff. And, and you know, that is obviously bad in, in, in another way. Um, but I understand, again, I also understand the impulses. I mean, you know, everyone is basically just trying to make ends meet in a system that is basically not really tailored to handle it. Um, and in podcasting, we've seen we've seen this. We've seen basically the, the death of limited series stuff. It's just basically impossible to for anyone outside of a major kind of national broadcaster to, to sell in advance on a limited series. And so everyone pushes these, you know, either either always on shows that are just you know me and you in rambling for an, an hour or they are like you know these sort of pseudo documentary shows which have which still produce 40 episodes a year which no one can reasonably make 40 documentary episodes a year but they they sort of you know things like my favorite murder they sort of talk around a wikipedia page or sort of like and so basically everything has has gone to being saying you know the financial model for for people who are outside who do not have infinite pots of gold is you must produce more content, more frequently, more regular, longer, all of these things. Um, and that's just a that's just a technical barrier at the moment. So, um, yeah, look, I, I, I always agreed that it was in the interest of podcasting to to polish up its act, to get more professional, to make better content, to not just have a bunch of rambling, you know, white guys in their basement talking about things that they think are interesting. That was always a good move for podcasting. But the reality is it just doesn't pay anymore. I mean, and it's just it's just expensive and the the ad mechanics are not there. And, you know, yeah. And as you've experienced on YouTube, it's just it rewards this this kind of, yeah, discursive yeah. rambling format. I wanted to go into the revenue part because obviously you, you pointed out and in your piece on your newsletter, Future Proof, about the lack of revenue from ants itself. But it did make me think of other revenue streams. So I've seen other, other podcasts, you know, merch, uh, events, uh, books, etc. So really, the 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 podcast in and of itself um, doesn't so much directly generate uh, generate revenue, but effectively it's a platform for other products. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering what your thinking is around that. Is that sustainable? Can independent publishers, such as South and others, do that or is this more just for the bigger boys no i i think this is this is a great equalizer i mean i think it's i think the ability to sell, sell merchandise the ability particularly to sell events i mean in, in my end of year piece i made the comparison you know there's this conversation in the music industry about how often album sales are perceived as basically just a way of advertising your stadium tour because you know that's where the real money is and i think there are podcast companies that um that kind of think that way and, and i have a client for instance who who is now is moving to a monthly live event version of their podcast because they think that that is where they will see the greatest value add and i know that there are like other podcasts i'm thinking of like something like no such thing as a fish which have just historically always done about 50 percent of their episodes from live shows because you know again it's just a great revenue source and you can reuse it a second time uh, as a podcast so look i think they're all great opportunities and that's kind of what I come back to is this idea that like the podcast of the future and by the future, I mean the next year, two years, um, probably is a much more like diverse mixed media product. And probably, yeah, it's it's live events as much as it is podcasts. It may be that people access it predominantly as a live event rather than as a as a as a podcast. I mean, I you know, all of these things are like op open opportunities to creative producers. Yeah, yeah. So there's plenty of opportunities there. I mean, just going back to what you were saying about more of the independent production houses and obviously the people like the BBC, NPR, etc. Have you thought much about the potential cultural impact? Uh, you know, if we compare it to independent films, independent films have their own festivals, have uh, somewhat of an ecosystem. But occasionally you get an in indie film that breaks through and can change the cultural landscape, can change what we're talking about. Presumably, that's also possible through a podcast, or are you saying that that possibility has become narrower and narrower? I think it's ten times more possible for a podcast than a film. Um, you know, I remember in in the summer of twenty twenty, that summer of lockdown, 
um, I made a podcast in my bedroom, a podcast documentary in my bedroom. And then, you know, uh, I released it and a, and a week, you know, the next week I was reading it reviewed in the Financial Times. And now that just cannot happen in any other medium, even, you know, music. It just doesn't happen. The PR machines are too big. You know, podcast still has no, you know, no discernible PR machine. So like the the, the opportunities for indie producers are still better in podcasting than than in anything else. Um but yeah, I mean, it's 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 in a state of um, change, per- perpetual change, because originally podcasting was very much an indie thing, and it was a sort of passion project, and people would work for nothing, and and you know, there's still that that culture still persi- persists in indie film. There's still like a you know, I, I've done a lot of work in in London's indie film scene in, 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 over the last ten years, um, and there's still a lot of people who will just do it for the love of it. They write scripts, they go and they help out friends. There's collaborative stuff. That culture is, I think, much less um, apparent in in podcasting, which has professionalized very rapidly. And I think possibly because a lot of the people who were making the sort of indie hits in podcasting um, 10 years ago have have, have signed multi-million dollar deals with the big tech companies you know, the, the 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 reality is that the indie has become mainstream very quickly and aggressively in podcasting in a way it, it never had with film. And there is still like a in film, there's this culture of being a cinephile, of like loving the medium. And obviously there are plenty of people who are audiophiles and plenty of people who love podcasts, but it, it doesn't it, it inspire the same sort of romanticism. So for, for whatever reason, like I think that podcasting is in a more corporate place now than um than filmmaking certainly and possibly possibly any other medium i mean it's just it, you know and i and i again i'm not sure if it's necessarily a strength but it's just part of the transition out of this amateur phase through the professional phase and now into this kind of evolutionary butterfly emerging from chrysalis phase yeah so just going in on the types of formats because last year when i spoke to you know a fellow sort of contact Fiona Sturgis out of the FT who I know you know well and um, we talked about sort of celebrity podcasts and basically her being a bit bored of them quite frankly because it was just stick a celebrity and you know x and maybe it's on a particular subject but you know there's a saturation of them um including that and any others are there other trends that you're you're spotting that have become quite formulaic in the industry yeah, I mean, the celebrity thing was yeah, the co- the COVID pandemic was a particularly bad catalyst for that as a trend because all these comedians were suddenly stuck at home um, with no one to listen to them and very used to appearing on panel shows and doing st- stadium gigs and stuff. And and so it just became so endemic, um, you know, and it just felt like, again, almost every little production company was suddenly realizing that they had much more clout. They could, all of these people wanted to make podcasts. They didn't have to have that much upfront capital to sign them. They could do advertising deals and all the distributors wanted to deal with name talent. Now, you know, and I, and I think that persists. I, I, and I think it's a story, you know, an age old story. Cause even, you know, if you think about like, you know, the pioneers of, podcasting people like Mark Maron and Joe Rogan I mean they 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 were famous you know well-known comedians before they were podcasters they didn't come out of nowhere I think it's ma- massively harder now to be a to make your name as a podcaster first than it was 10 years ago I think that probably that that ship has sailed to some extent I think it's much you'd be much better off you know, trying to break out as a comedian or an actor or journalist and then transitioning into podcasting now. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, so I, I mean, I agree with Fiona's exhaustion with the with the but I understand it with the celebrity culture in podcasting. Um, and then, yeah, I think I mean, I think oversaturation is something that we've considered a lot in podcasting for the last few years. I mean, the numbers of the raw numbers of podcasts has got, have gone up basically in a totally, um, totally out of proportion with audience increases um and i think that has basically just meant that it's it's ever harder for a new release to kind of break through into the mainstream and i see a lot of dissatisfied people who are dissatisfied with their 10 episodes you know the first point in which you might look back and analyze your figures that that their listening figures um so i think you know that's another kind of just just general question is like whether whether audiences have basically been served with the content they want 
And now it's basically really, really hard to supplement that. There's, there, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, these niches in podcasting, whether podcasting is a good medium for people who have more specific interests. But I mean, there are very few specific interests that are not now quite adequately catered to. So, yes. um, yeah, there's, so it's, again, these are, but these are challenges faced by basically all parts of the media at all times. So what have you made of the sort of rise of the rest is history podcast as an example you know, obviously, as you say, there's a particular, I suppose you could call it a niche, although history <laughs> covers, yeah. covers a big <laughs> niche, yeah, uh, quite quite a wide breadth. And I think, personally, I think that's why it's in quite well, because they can delve into different subjects with two historians who have that great knowledge, who obviously read up on it and bring experts in. But yeah. what, what are your learnings, if at all, from their success? And what have you taken away from that? Really? You know, it's it's the rest is history and and um the team behind it go at uh, Goalhanger podcast are, are basically a sort of unique case study in, in a way i think they're probably the worst people on earth that you could use as like an illustration of where the where the market is now and i've and i've spoken to them about this and i basically think they just they just they 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 hit on something amazing with tom holland and dominic samber getting them down there they got the cut through everyone everyone loves the podcast you know, and the fact is that they've been able to spin it off into the second podcast, The Rest is Politics, which is basically almost equally successful and kind of defies all of my, as someone who predominantly has made politics podcasts over, over my career, defies all of my expectations for how well that product would have done. Um, they still have like a basically their, their, their company is basically running off 100 percent ad revenue um, as a business model. They own their own IP. They only produce their own properties. They don't do they, they're not looking to make commissions they're not looking to do partnerships they're not doing corporate work they just own their own ip sell ad revenue on it and they make a ton of money and they sell out the albert hall and stuff like that they 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 are basically lightning in a bottle um and i and i and i just don't know whether they're necessarily instructive because yes it, it, it if you if you manage to find two historians who have that chemistry and that charisma and they, they can make it work and they can talk on a diverse range of topics it it, it brilliant um like, but chances are it doesn't do a, a, a fraction of the business that the rest, is, the rest is history does, and then it's just not sustainable. But to just to just do a solely an ad revenue um, system, and I um, suppose we, we could say both the presenters Tom Holland and Dom Sandbrook already had a pretty big media profile, um, and. But I, I think that I was going to go into actually with media profile, both of them, those gentlemen are well followed on Twitter, amongst other things. And, you know, we've both worked in the news industry and we know Twitter isn't necessarily the best converter. But I was wondering what the best converter is for podcasts. Well, look, I, I had um, I must have made half a dozen podcasts with Tom Holland before he launched The Rest Is history over the course of when I used to work with The Spectator and places like Reaction and Engelsberg. Um, we'd done a bunch of things with him and they never did discernibly any better or worse than any other podcast made, that I made and never anything like what the rest of history does. So I, I don't think it's as simple as being like they had, they ha they both have big media fo the followings, they both have big Twitter followings. You know, all credit to the people at Goalhanger because they, they managed to convert way beyond the what I think would have been a reasonable expectation um for it. Uh do I think that like social media is a good converter? I mean look it's it's unfortunately it's better than nothing. Um and you know what else what else are you going to do? Like um I've again as I say just from just from the, the the blunt experience of being like what what converts into listeners um you know ha having having a decent following on Twitter is is a, is a net positive. I mean, I I just a few weeks ago we launched a podcast called A Pod Too Far with Robert Hutton and Duncan Weldon, who probably have between them you know 100, 150 thousand Twitter followers. Um, and yeah, I can see a tangible conversion there from the listening to that uh, from 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 following them on Twitter to listening to the podcast. But you know, nothing like enough to. Um, put it straight into the top of the charts nothing like enough to put it straight into advertising profitability um and uh, yeah so that's so basically i don't think twitter you know it's obviously if you have a million followers on twitter you're going to be able to convert maybe one you know one or half a percent of them over to your podcast for, for episode one you'll have a you, you know a, a half life and tail off over the next few episodes so so it, I, I don't know. There's there's a there's a there's a word of mouth thing and it's got a self 
um, powering thing that is much more important, but it's also much harder to generate. And it's it's undoubtedly true that, that Spotify and Apple still have like a huge curation power in this industry. And they're both privileging projects that they believe are commercially valuable to them now. Just the way that things have shaped up with the launch of Apple subscriptions, with the with the launch of Spotify subscriptions and also Spotify's own slate of podcasts mean that there are now a sufficient number of podcasts where they have a commercial you know, uh, predisposition to push that I think the historic sort of ambivalent curation that we saw and which was a huge asset to indie producers is basically that age is done now. If you go onto the Apple podcast homepage, which is a, 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 an amazing number of people use the Apple podcast homepage as a, as a kind of guide to finding their next podcast. Listen, strikes me as kind of a crazy thing to do, but all that evidence suggests that people do still do that. But you, you go on there now and they are heavily pushing shows that have some sort of subscription me- mechanism with them or shows that they're Apple originals or anything like that. It's just, it's just, so yeah, it's, it's becoming a much narrower um, curation pathway um, and I think that's probably sim- just a trend, yeah, of having more people with financial dogs in the fight. Uh, and with that, how many people do you think are actually making money off podcasts? And a related question, when you talked about the charts, how far up the charts do you need to get until you start making uh, serious money or substantial where you could a project can wash its face? Uh, it, you can ignore the charts. The charts are bullshit. I'm sorry, can I swear? <laughs> I've done it now. Um, they're they're rubbish. The Apple charts are are a, a nonsense. I mean, they're not. It's nothing like a like an audience data chart. You know, I, I can publish a a if I launch a new show and get five hundred listens on day one, I would expect to be in my categories top twenty, regardless of the fact that the other people in the top twenty are probably getting ten, fifteen thousand listens an episode. So it's full of all sorts of algorithmic biases, and Apple has always been a little bit obscure about what exactly they are but certainly newness frequency there's probably something to do with 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 interactions whether whether they're actually writing ratings and reviews or just visiting the page on the podcast that sort of thing so there's all sorts of weird quirks in there so how high up you are in the charts i think is is a slightly misleading way of looking at it i think you in raw listener data i think you probably any podcast probably needs to be getting it depends on whether you're you have your own ad sales team if you have your own ad sales team, I think you can probably get a podcast to wash its face with about 10,000 listens. If you are relying on the CPMs offered by the big a- tech agencies in the UK, Acast, Audio Boom, um, I think you probably need somewhere between 20 and 30 before you can wash your face, 20, 20 30,000 listeners per episode, um, w- w- which are kind of brutal figures, I think, for most producers. That they're, 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 you know, most podcasts are nowhere near that that kind of level of financial stability so coming back then to the first question which is how many podcasts make make money i mean to to make an actual profit you know that a lot of podcasters basically write off their own time as like as a non-business expense um which is fine um but it basically means i I would guess that that the number of podcasts that make profit is somewhere close to one percent um you know if you factored in basically the host labor, it would be about, I would imagine about 1%. Um, so, uh, and then how many people are, you know, how many companies, you know, there are plenty of companies who, who are profitable, but all the profitable work that people like myself do is basically uh, corporate stuff where we're basically just repackaging press releases in an audio format, which is, you know, a bit more interesting, a bit more dynamic than people are used to. And it's something that, that most major companies have gone in for pretty heavily over the last 10 years i think the number of serious you know companies with you know a couple of hundred plus members of employees probably 80 percent of them have have some sort of podcast you know so yeah i mean people have gone so heavily for it that it's no surprise that that's kind of underpin financially underpin the whole industry but i think there's real real questions about whether that trend continues when you know oh. I mean, how how scale, scalable is that? Because you talked about Goal Hanger. They've got another uh, podcast. I mean, one of the most famous ones, I suppose, would be Crooked Media with the guys, the former Obama guys, and they set up a range of different podcasts. Is it, if you get one success, use the same production team, then start, for want of a better phrase, start, you know, getting a load of content out there, and that's how you make the money? I don't think it's 
scalable in a meaningful way. I think it's possible to build a a good sized business. And I guess the the Ur example is Alex Bloomberg and Gimlet, which again, it, it wasn't a scalable business, but it also did exit for a hundred million dollars plus. So in that sense, it looks much more like one. Um I think the guys at Goalhanger could repeat their trick. They, you know, they did the rest of history. They could do, they've done the rest is politics. What's to say they couldn't do the, you know, the rest is football. Um, and they could repeat that trick a few times and they would be a profitable company and they would be a profitable, you know, medium sized enterprise. Um, I don't think, I don't think it's seriously scalable as a business, but, you know, again, a lot of people in, in the content production world, Crooked, for example, you know, Gimlet, Wondery, all of these people basically source the end goal of scalability as an exit to, to a big tech firm. And we had those acquisitions, you know, Spotify buying Gimlet, Amazon buying Wondery, you know, uh, everyone may basically made these acquisitions. I, I can't, I don't, can't remember if Crooked's been, been bought out, but they've certainly done a lot of big commercial partnerships. Um, and, you know, there's reporting, you know, I, I don't know if you read the Bloomberg piece, um, which basically suggests that a lot of these big acquisition deals are, looking you know looking like they won't they won't happen in the future there's some that would be mooted that are now going on ice you know there's talk of people trying to wriggle out of like like of of licensing agreements and that sort of thing so i don't think i I think i think an industry that kind of sees its ultimate level of scalability as a sale uh is probably not truly scalable but you know a good a good content business is, is not a bad thing it doesn't need to it doesn't need to have exponential growth but um but yeah i don't think it's really scalable okay i'm gonna sort of move things to around wrapping up so just move to sort of quick fire if you don't mind okay how many podcasts do you listen to slash are you subscribed to uh non-paying subscriptions yes i probably they're probably three or four that i listen to regularly these days there are probably 20 that i'm subscribed to yeah um how do you listen to them out of interest I listen to over phone or tv or oh right i listen to all of them on my phone yeah all on phone okay commuting presumably or just in general for me generally when i'm walking the dog okay walking the dog and sort of who who inspires you if it's all in the industry is someone doing something cool that you think yeah that's that's pretty remarkable or has really stood out recently to you I think there are a lot of people who, who do really cool stuff. And, uh, you know, in, in the documentary arena, I mean, I think that like Jonathan Goldstein, the stuff he does with heavyweight, it, it is on a par with any other media I consume in terms of, I think, the actual like raw quality of the product. Um, you know, some of John Ronson's docu- podcast documentaries, I think that, you know, the butterfly effect and last days of August are every bit as good as John Ronson's books. And that's, again, a, a, a huge compliment, I think, for, from from where I'm sitting. So, those sort of creators, I think, are quite inspiring. But, you know, I am also inspired by the guys at Goalhanger. Like, I don't listen to their podcasts, uh, but I, I am inspired by what they're doing because they're, they are creating they are creating something out of nothing. And I'm, you know, and I am inspired by all the people who make um, kind of new editorial products and, and, and use the podcast as a primary editorial medium, which I think, you know, it, I'm, I, we're so reliant on podcasts that are like, oh, this newspaper has a podcast that, you know, and so I'm, so anytime I see someone come along and be like, okay, we're, we're starting a podcast and we're getting serious talent involved with, you know, investing in it and we're believing in an audio first product. Yeah. I'm, to t- some extent I'm, I'm, I'm inspired, but I'm not a good consumer of product or, or, or podcast because I spend the whole day with my headphones in. Um, and so I'm very, you know, usually I, I give my ears a break. I mean, that raises a question. How quickly into episodes, and you're on the production side, how quickly into episodes do you know that this thing's a bit of a duffer and it's not going to take off? Uh, well, it depends because 90% of the shows I make, don't. it doesn't really matter how well they do. Um, they're, the KPIs are different. They're non-audience. I, I, we, I always say wait for 10 episodes. Um, which is the same as the advertisers would say. They would say we can't sell before 10 episodes because you need to have an idea of what the audience figures are before we pitch to our advertisers. So, yeah, wait as long as you can afford to wait would be my would be my recommendation. And final one to really put on you. I mean, what are your thoughts on what podcasting is going to look like in five years time? My best guess is that it will look a lot like YouTube. Um, I think YouTube is just far and away the most successful media business in the world right now it is one of the few businesses that has 
a long history of tradition has a has a has a huge uptake people you know children use it older people use it the, the demographics are better than anywhere else you know it has genuine um conversion mechanisms you know it has a genuine ways that people make money from youtube i mean i i've got I, I work with someone who's got a million followers on tiktok he's not made a penny from it he's not you know he cannot make cannot get money out of tiktok he's desperate to convert his followers over to youtube because youtube there is there is still there is a pathway to make money um and you know it doesn't it doesn't take a genius to realize that youtube can cannibalize podcasting in a way that they 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 haven't done so far and there's all this talk about youtube podcast i think that's a that's a mistake linear youtube you you most video products you don't need to really watch with the video on as you noted from the start you can put it on in the background have it as, as a passive consumption and it becomes a podcast you can make it you can make a video podcast just by shutting the screen off and so i think there's that that functionality is it built into into you into youtube and i and i my suspicion is that youtube will will just continue to grow and dominate this market space because i just don't see anyone doing a better product and i just think it's we're probably too late down the line for really insurgent new media technology to kind of come through so do i think that spotify has a rational enough business plan and a stable enough capital stream to challenge youtube i i, I don't think so over the, over five years um and so it's just a case of whether youtube wants to diversify its portfolio and whether it whether it plays it safely and sanely and i suspect probably over the next five years they will right, final one is ai going to take over podcasting well I, I hope i hope not ian um i mean it will definitely take over lots of bits of it but um but I, you know i we've had we've had tools in podcasting over the last five years that have come along that have done things like dming and um you, you know t- which which try and solve some of the problems of of people's speech syntax and that sort of thing and i've never i've never seen someone new or heard someone use one of these tools and not had it immediately obvious to me when they have and not immediately thought this i would do a better job of doing this as a man at a computer just choosing the moments choosing the rhythm getting everything handmade so i think it's got some way to go and i also suspect that the people who are working on ai technology have you know better uses for it than putting some pod, pod bum podcasters out of business so i mean i i hope not but undoubtedly it will have a huge impact well we'll see watch your back uh nick hilton thanks very much future future proof po dot on the twitters uh thanks very much for your time pleasure